I, I want to jump back in today to what has been our summer series, and I'll welcome all those online who are watching with us. Um, our summer series has been called Just Like Us. And um, if you've missed any of the, the messages, or even maybe if you're here for the first time, first let me say welcome, and second let me, let me get you up to speed that the reason it's called Just Like Us is because this series was born out of a concern that I carry for you. And the concern is this, that when you hear a, a sermon from the Bible or you read the Bible for yourselves, that you have a tendency to disconnect what you expect in your life from what you've read, that you have a tendency to dis disconnect from what you've read to what you expect in your life. And, and, and you hear it in language, maybe internal dialogue, where you hear kind of this idea, well, that was a special time, or those were special people, and that's why God did so many significant or special things. And so this series is really to come against that thinking and to help you realize that scripture pours out again and again and again that those folks were just like us. That, that, that in fact, it's, it's all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament that they were people just like us. That they weren't in, in fact special and that wasn't just a special time, but that God wants to do the extraordinary and the supernatural through people just like us. And so each week we've been pulling a person from the pages of scripture and just looking at their life. And, and my goal has been to show you their humanity, but also show you how they're people just like us, yet God did significant things through them. And so we've been doing this for several weeks, and today I want to give you kind of the eighth installment, or the eighth episode, and it comes from a man um, who is in the Old Testament whose name is Nehemiah. And, and the reason that his life is so important to each of us, and I mean to every person here, is this, that Nehemiah's story tells us how we can overcome distractions. How we can overcome distractions. Now, um, I, 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 I'm kind of curious. Um, I know personally that I find it very difficult to stay focused. How many of you right out of the gate would just own it? You, you throw up your hand and say, I struggle to stay focused. I struggle to stay on point. I struggle to stay focused. Um, I easily get distracted, right? Because focus is a fight. To, to, to really remain focused, that's a fight. I, I mean, you know, it's, it's like you sit down at your desk. You've got these things you want to do, and then the emails start ding, ding, ding. And, you know, the next thing you know, you're online shopping because you followed some trail of emails, right? Uh, and, and, then, and then, you know, like, like for some of you who, who've got kids at home right now, you had a to-do list that started in May that is still undone. And it's because your distractions are home for the summer. And you're, you're waiting to get your focus back when school starts back. And, and then for, for, for some of you, this is the story of your faith that you sat down wanting to grow in your faith. And you sat down and you open your phone to read the Bible. The problem is the Bible app is right beside of social media, and you end up looking more at what they posted than what he has said, and, and so, you know, the struggle is focused. It's, it's a fight. It's a, it's a distraction. It's tough. I mean, even here, th this place is not, you know, we're, we're not immune to that here. Even today, your mind is going to wonder. You're, you're going to be sitting there listening, and the next thing you know, you're like, well, I wonder where I'm going to go eat. I mean, what, what, what am I hungry for? And then, and then it's going to go like, why does she wear that? I mean, and then, and then it's going to be like, should I mow the grass when I get home? home. And, you know, you're, it's just hard to keep focused. Listen, it's hard for me to keep focus up here because you all, listen, I can see you pick your nose. I can see it. I, I, this, there's not, like, you are not hidden to me. I can see you talk and eat and text. I, listen, I can see you sleeping. Sometimes you think, like, I, man, he's passionate. No, I'm trying to wake you up. Like, like I can see, and sometimes that's distracting for me because it's, it's a fight to focus, and, and distractions are, are pulling at all of our lives. Lives. And, and, and so t t today, I, I want to tell you that that is a big deal. It's a big deal. Because if you and I were to sit down and we were to take inventory of the places in your life that aren't where you want them to be, I bet that we could trace it back to the cause is distractions. Like, like some of you are not as intimate with your spouse as you want to be. And it's because you're too intimate with your phone. Distractions. 
So, 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 some of you, 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 you've had this thing, you go start a business for years, and yet this business has never been started. And it's because if we traced it back, there's distractions that are keeping from taking the step. L- listen, that's the story of some of your faith. You have such a desire to know God the way that you hear other people talk about him, and yet you, you just there's this distraction. You can't ever seem to get in, in focus, and there's this distraction. And so, so I want you to imagine for a second, if you you were able to overcome distractions. Imagine the floodgate of blessing that would open in your life because you're finally able to focus on what God has called you to do and and to become. Imagine if there, there, there weren't distractions. That's why it's such a big deal, and that's why we need Nehemiah. Nehemiah's story um, is contained. He's the central figure of a book that carries his namesake. And, um, and, and, And when the story opens... Um, the people of God or the Israelites are, are not in their, their homeland. They're actually in captivity to a foreign king named Artaxerxes. And, um, and Nehemiah is a Jew, and he actually works in the palace of this king. And one day, the the story unfolds that one of Nehemiah's relatives, who's been on a long journey to visit the the nation of Israel, has come back, and he's telling Nehemiah about the state of his homeland. And he's telling him about how how, how because it's been ransacked and it's been conquered, that much of the the temple's in ruins and and, and the, 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 the city's in ruins. But he notes that the walls of the city of Jerusalem have been torn down. And that all that left is, is, is just rubble. And he brings that up because there's, there is a small group of Jews who are still living in there, but they can't get it, the, the, the plan of God restarted because they live in fear because they have no protection in the city they're living in. And so all of a sudden, the, the Bible says that Nehemiah's heart is stirred by the Holy Spirit and that he is called by God to go back and help rebuild the walls so that God can restart the plan that he has for his people. And the Bible says that he goes to Artaxerxes and he asks to go and that the king shows favor to him and actually funds portions of the trip. And the book of Nehemiah unpacks how, in fact, Nehemiah goes back, builds up the walls so that, that again, the nation can begin to rebuild and and how he he leads them into not just a physical rebuilding, but also a spiritual rebuilding. It's a significant story. You should read it. Um, But but, but the, the reason that I love it is because it's so easy to connect to Nehemiah. For you and I, it's so easy. Because at the end of the day, Nehemiah is an ordinary guy trying to build what God has given him. And that isn't, in fact, what you and I are. We're just ordinary people, people just like us, who, but yet God has given you something to build. Now, we're all building different things. Some of you, God is building, using you to build a marriage. Some of you, God's using you to rebuild a marriage. For, for some, God, you, you're building children and, and raising them. For some, you're building a ministry. For some, you're building a career. For some, you're building an education so that, that you can do something. For some, God's building your character right now, and that's what he's asking you to be a part of the build. For some of you, you're building a dream. For some, you're building a legacy. It doesn't really matter what the details of what you're building are. The fact remains that you are building. And what I know and what you know is that if you're ever going to build anything that has lasting significance, you have to build with a long-standing focus. Focus. To really build something great, it's going to take some time, and you're going to have to keep your head down and do it again and again and again. And that's the reason that we bring up Nehemiah, because Nehemiah reveals a spiritual principle that's true in your life, and it was true in his life, that when the work starts up, the enemy shows up. And that opposition will always come to oppose what it is that God is trying to build in your life. It happened in Nehemiah's life, and it happens in your life, that because you've committed to building this thing that God's given you, there is opposition to it. And you can find it in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 7, when it says, But when Sambalot and Tobiah and the Arabs and Ammonites and Ashdodites heard the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. And they made plans out of their fury to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. Now listen, Nehemiah um, shows up and starts the work, and immediately three adversaries that repeat again and again and again show up as well. Now they are physical adversaries, but, but the reality is they paint a picture of our spiritual adversary. And I love how their nature is the same as his, because what it says is, is that, first of all, in another passage it says they hated this work, and it also says that they were furious because of this work. And you better not make a mistake for one second to think that you're not on the radar of your spiritual enemy. 
He hates what you're building. And he has no mercy because they're children or because it's a dream or it's a legacy. He hates what you're building and he will do anything. It says they made plans. Do anything to cause you to slow progress and to not build what God has called you to build. And he'll do anything, including make a plan that leads you into confusion. You see, your spiritual opposition has been at this long enough that he's de- decided and determined and fine tested. His, his abilities, that he knows that one devil doesn't fit all sizes of, 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 of assignment. And here's what he's determined, that for some, he doesn't need to destroy you if he can just distract you. That if, in fact, he doesn't need to take you out as long as he can take your eyes off the prize of what God's calling you to build. He doesn't need to finish you as long as he can break your focus. He doesn't have to destroy you if he can simply distract you. Distraction is just as useless in God's kingdom as those who have been destroyed because of the work of the enemy. And so he works diligently to raise confusion so that you live a distracted life. See, he wants you to think that distraction is not that big a deal. Because after all, I mean, I just need to try harder. I just need to fight more. I just need to get my attention. No, you are fighting for the thing that God's called you to build in your life. And that's the reason that the enemy is wiping so many of us out on the playing field of distraction because we're not taking serious one of his greatest assaults that when we choose to build what God's got us to build, it's so easy to be distracted. Now, 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 I looked up the word distraction and it comes from a, a Latin meaning that originated around 1590. And here's what it means, to pull apart, to draw apart, to separate. To pull apart, to draw apart, to separate. And I found something very interesting, um, that in the Middle Ages, the French had a form of torture where they would tie um, ropes to the, to the limbs of an individual and then tie those ropes to, to four different horses so that the horses would pull in separate directions, and guess what they called it? Death by distraction. Look, look I got you a picture of it, because I, I just think a picture's worth a thousand words. Look, look, look at this. Death by distraction. I look at that, and I'm like, that's what it takes to get me in skinny jeans. It would take all that <laughs> to fit all this in there. Um, death by distraction. Now, why did I take the time to show you this? Because I think if there's a picture that is a portrait of the way so many of you are living on the inside, pulled by distractions, separated by distractions, drawn in different directions, unable. I think for many of you that literally your God-given calling is experiencing death by distraction. And I, I give you the picture because I think that, that it's so poignant. I want it to stick with you that this is what some of you are enduring. But the good news is you don't have to live this way. You don't, you don't have to live this way. Because in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 35, it says this, serve the Lord without distraction. Come on, I, we need to get that in us. I want you to say it with me right now. Serve the Lord without distraction. You see, here's the thing about God. God never instructs us to do something without giving us the power to actually walk it out. See, it would be cruel of God to tell us to do something and then us not be able to do it. So when God gives you an instruction, he also gives you the empowerment to actually walk it out, which means when he says, serve me without distraction, he's saying, I've put something on the inside of you that if you'll tap into it, you can actually live this out. And that something is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is on the inside of you. The Bible says it's the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, that it's so powerful it overcome death, and if you learn to trust him, he will help you overcome distraction or death death by distraction. Listen, that's why some of you need to stop going to try this blog or this technique or if I download this app. Listen, I'm not against all that stuff, but I'm just saying you've already got the solution on the inside of you. You need to stop saying, you know, I'm just not disciplined. Yes, you are because the Holy Spirit's on the inside of you and he has caused you to have a fruit of self-control in your life. So we say, but I get so overwhelmed. It doesn't matter because the Holy Spirit's on the inside of you and he dispenses enough grace for everything that you'll ever face. Yeah, yeah, 
yeah, yeah, but I just struggle with follow through. Yeah, but the Holy Spirit's on the inside of you, and he's an author and a finisher, and he's going to help you carry out everything that God's called you to do. You don't need anything other than to depend more on the Holy Spirit, and he will help you to focus. He'll put on blinders from distractions. He'll close your ears, and he will help you build what God's called you to build. You just have to learn to depend on him. So, so, so listen, um, that's the story of Nehemiah. The story of Nehemiah is what God can do through someone who lets the Holy Spirit refuse distractions and refocus their attention on what God's called them to do. That, that is what the Holy Spirit offers to do. He offers to, 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 to refuse distractions. You get to use his power, not your own, and he'll refocus you on what God's called you to do if you depend on him. And Nehemiah is a, is, a, is a picture of what that looks like. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you through Nehemiah's story, and I'm going to pull out three things, three ways that you can choose every day to depend on the Holy Spirit. And the more you depend on him, the less distractions will impair you. And, and I'm going to show you these three things, real practical, but I'm telling you, it could be the difference between you be sitting here next year just spinning your wheels trying to accomplish what God's, or for you gaining traction and truly becoming the person God's called you to be. So here, here's, here's the very first one. Here it is. Very first thing you got to do from the life of Nehemiah, Nehemiah began with God's direction. He began with God's direction. Now, Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4 says that before Nehemiah ever picked up a shovel, before he ever got a hammer, before he ever stacked one brick on another, he went to God first and prayed. And here's why. Because Nehemiah has figured out, if I make God first, God gives me focus. If I make God first, God gives me focus. And he repeats it in chapter 4 and verse 9. We just read it, how all those, the, 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 the spiritual opposition comes and causes distraction. And guess what? You will never find Nehemiah fighting with them, arguing with them, or engaging them. The moment the spiritual opposition showed up, Nehemiah first responded by going right back to prayer in, in, in chapter 4, verse 9. Because Nehemiah's figured out, if I'll make God first... God will give me focus. It actually happens 12 times in the whole book of Nehemiah that something happens that causes a distraction or, or to invite Nehemiah into the distraction. And every single time, all 12 times, he instead of engaging distraction, he makes God first and returns to God in prayer. Because Nehemiah has figured out, if I can make God first, God can give me focus. If I can make God first, God can give me focus. If I can make God first, God will give me focus. Do you know why that's so relevant for you? Because you live in a day more than any other day in human history where it is easy to be distracted. Listen, <laughs> um, technology has made you available always and to a litany of voices that will drag you everywhere but towards God. More than any time in history. So Nehemiah, it points out, Nehemiah didn't have to make God first once he made God first again and again and again. Let me say it this way. You don't need focus once. You need focus every day. And Nehemiah gives us the, the, the reason how. If I could do anything, I mean anything, to help you be successful in life, one thing, I mean if I reduced it to one thing, it would make, make God first. Let, let me show you why. Matthew 6.33, very popular verse. Jesus says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given as well. Jesus says, you put God first, and then the, the, his righteousness is going to come, and then you'll get everything you need. Do you know what righteousness means? Righteousness means to be in right standing with God. It means to be in right believing. It means to have right thinking. So, so here's what it says. If you'll put God first, you'll get right thinking. And guess what follows right thinking? Right living. If you think right, you're going to live right. And that's the reason you, have, you would be amazed when you make God first what God can make happen in your life. You'd be amazed. When, all you've got to do is make God first. We try so hard to do so many other things. If you'll simply just make God first of every area of your life, here's why. Because without God being first in an area of your life, that area gets no blessing, no strength, and no supernatural favor or ability. Wherever God's not first, there is no blessing of God. And that means you're left to do it all in your own strength. That's why I just want God to be first in every area of my life. 
I, I mean, that's just what I want. That's what I want for you. Listen, if you make God the first of your year by giving him 21 days of prayer and fasting like we do every year, God blesses the other 11 months where all of the sudden what happens is, is that instead of living a year of regret, you live a year of reward because you put God first. It means he makes the connections that you normally couldn't make. He helps you keep the health goals that normally you drop. He helps you study in a way and persevere in a way that you, you haven't in the past just by simply putting him first. It works in your finances. If you make God first in your finances by tithing, then God blesses the, the other 90% that's left. You know what that means? It means you get supernatural wisdom for investments that you never had before. It means you get self-control to, to avoid debt so that you don't go into a worse scenario than you already in. It, it also means he gives you creative ideas to generate more income and, and, and gives you favor for more shifts and more insight. He gives you a heart of generosity so you can be a part of his kingdom just by simply making it first. It works with the first of your week. If you make God the first of your week, today you're doing that by, by attending church. He blesses the other six days of the week. Listen, you know what happens is you come in here and he expands your vision for his will for your life. You come in here and he tears down the lies of the enemy that aren't supposed to remain in your life. And he doesn't just do it for you. When you bring your family, God doesn't just work on you. He works on every member of your family. There's been plenty of times in our house where Kayla was saved and I wasn't. But because we came to church, that we God worked in both of our lives and he able to work in both of us to help us become more like him. You want to see your family turn around, get them in church. God will work in all of them. You don't have to fix them. God will do the fixing. Listen, and it works at the front of your day. If you make God the first of your day, he blesses the other 23 hours. He aligns your heart with his heart. He aligns your words with his words. He aligns your mind with his mind, and that means you get a divine reprogramming to where next time you walk in and distractions come, you can discern between what should be engaged and what shouldn't be engaged. You can choose between what matters and what doesn't matter. You can see where you should invest and where you shouldn't invest. You receive a divine focus when you make God first and you're able to walk into what normally derails you and choose to stay on the path God has you building what God's got for you. Listen to me. I've learned I don't have to fight near as hard if I'll just make God first. He does all the fighting if I'll just make him first. And Nehemiah found out that you don't have to fight all these battles. You can put God first and he'll give you divine focus. Nehemiah heard every day what he should do from God because he made God first in his life and by hearing what God called. Listen, the closer you draw to Jesus, the clearer what you should do becomes. The closer you get to him, the easier it is to tell what matters. The closer you get to him, the more he reprograms who you are. You don't need to try harder. You need to make him first and you'll receive divine focus because of it. So that's the first thing you did. Now here, here's the second one. Nehemiah protected his progress by restoring the gates. Um, one of the most significant steps Nehemiah took was this. He not only was building the walls, but gates that had been torn down, he restored seven of them. Seven gates, chapter 3 tells you, you put up seven gates that have been torn down. Why is that significant? Because gates control access. And if you are going to overcome distractions, you need some gates that help decide what comes in and what goes out. Okay, I'm going to give you three gates every single person needs. Three gates every single person needs. Here's the first one. You need a people gate. A people gate. Um, I read a, a bumper sticker one time that said, um, God loves you and everyone's got a plan for your life. God loves you and everyone has a plan for your life. And that's true. Everybody has a plan for your life. And many of you are not living God's plan for your life because you're living other people's plan for your life. And you need a gate that decides who comes in and who comes out. Now, let me say this. I know some of you, you just don't like people. So you say, well, Pastor Joe said I can bust everybody out. I don't have to have nobody. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm saying that a gate helps you determine who should be there and who shouldn't be there. Some of you do need a new, new relationships. And that's, you need to let some people in. But some of you, many of you, you need to get people out because people are a distraction. And that means at some point when, when people cut, walk across the, the hall and invite you into gossip, you need to shut the gate on them. That means at some point when, when you get that late phone call from your crazy cousin, you just need to let it go to voicemail because you just need, you need to shut the gate on that. That means for, for some of you, your kids, uh, you're trying to get your own life, but they're constantly trying to get you to live their life for them. You just need to shut the gate. Come on, baby. you got to get out the eagle's nest and fly on your own because I have to focus on what God's called me to do. Now, listen. Listen, some of you are not going to like this um, to, to the reality, but, but you'll get good at it. You're going to have to say no to some people. 
But listen, when you say no, you're in good company. Jesus said no to a lot of people. There were many towns who wanted Jesus to say, and Jesus said, no, I've got to go. There were many invites that Jesus received that he never took, because here's why. Jesus would not prioritize people over his father. And he said, i got to say no to you in order to be with him so that I can save you. And so you you got to get, listen, here's what Jesus knew. If you're always available to everyone, there will eventually come a time where you're no good to anyone because you have nothing to pour out. And that's why some of you haven't found your purpose yet and you, you don't feel like you have anything to give. You're so depleted that you don't have anything to give. But it's not because God didn't put anything in you. It's because people walk in and out of your life all the time, unrestricted. you you gotta, you got to get a people gate. Here's the other one. This one, everybody needs this. You need a phone gate. You need a phone gate. Um, the problem in our culture is we've made our greatest distraction handheld. And I, I read this book, uh, and the author, it's called 12 uh, Ways Your Phone is Changing You. And he said that the average person checks their phone 81,500 times a year, and they do it once every 4.3 minutes. So you're going to check your phone eight times before I'm done today. Now, um, here, here's the thing. Um, we are missing, we are missing meaningful moments because we are so tied to our phones. We're missing some of life's most meaningful moments. I, I'll give you an example. There was a guy named Eric Smith um, who was on a whale watching trip in California, and he took a picture of, of many pictures, but took one of another tour who was doing whale watching, and here's what he caught. I, I want you to see this. Um, this guy went on a trip to see whales and he missed a breaching whale because he was on his phone. And they, they caught it. And that's crazy, isn't it? Now, now what I think is crazy about that is this. Um, I'm going to be honest. I've missed a lot more meaningful moments than just a breaching whale because of my phone. I've missed moments with Kayla. I've missed moments with my kids. I, I, I've missed moments with God. And I bet you have too. Listen, I don't want to get to the end of my life and I know my cell phone carrier better than I know my own kids. I don't want to get to my life and have 3,000 friends on Facebook but not actually have any memories with the people I care most about. You need a phone gate. I don't know if that means you need to put it away, if that means you need to get to downgrade to a, to a jitterbug. I don't know if that means you need to, to like just do not disturb. A t- I don't know what that means exactly for you. I told Pastor Curtis in the back, I said, maybe we have like one of them old church, we have a phone burning today. Like we have people come forward and just put their phone down. But I know y'all, y'all wouldn't do it. The only people come up here and burn their phones, people are like, well, I need an upgrade anyways. You know, I mean, I just, I knew you're not going to do it because it's like it's an appendage to some of us. But I'm telling you, you need a phone gate. You need a phone gate. Now, here's the last one. Um, you need a priority gate. And the priority gate is, is, is who decides who moves to the front of the line in your life. It, it, it organizes your priorities. One of the things I, I would tell you is that, that, that this helped me so much. A priority gate reminds you when someone invites you into something that, number one, there is no more time. You don't get more time. We like to think we can make it all happen, but, but time is the great equalizer. And here's the second thing a priority gate reminds us. Not only does not, do we not get more time, but it reminds me, in order to give time to this, I have to take time from something else. So, so let me say it this way. Your yes to someone is your no to someone else. And, 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 and this helped me a whole lot because I, I really, um, especially early ministry, I wanted to please as many people as I could. I remember in our first couple years as pastor, I mean, you know, you're so gracious to invite us to be part of your life. And, and I remember we went to every birthday party, every wedding, every anniversary, every bar mitzvah. We, I mean, y'all, whatever it was, we tried to come. But here, one day I realized this, that yes to you was no to my own kids. And it just helped me get a priority. Listen, I have a priority gate that guards my heart. And it's a fight, but it is a a, a priority gate. And you need one. My priority gate on its list, it has been told to make God first. If he's in line wanting to spend time with me, he gets ahead of everybody else. Because if I don't stand before him in prayer, I can't stand before you on Sunday. So I have to say no to you in order to say yes to him in order to help you. 
Listen, uh, also on my priority gate list is Kayla. She is a VIP. She doesn't wait in line for everybody else. She moves to the front of the line. Because listen, what good does it do if I save your marriage but lose my own? That, that, that doesn't help anybody. Listen, my kids are on the VIP list. My kids are on the VIP list. And, 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 and here's what that means. Sometimes you and I will be talking in the lobby and, and you'll be telling me this really important thing and it is important. But when my kids come up, I will probably break attention with you and look to them because you can get a new pastor, but they can't get a new daddy. And so they have to be the VIP. You need a priority list. You, you need a priority gate. You need to know. You say, well, I don't know a minority. Then you need it. You need to sit down instead of going home and watching television. You need to write it out today. You need to figure out who gets in and who gets out. Because listen, you got to refuse the people who are walking unrestricted in and out of your life. Not all of them were created equal for you. God loves them all, but they're not all supposed to be in your life at the level that everybody is. Listen, you, 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 need, to, you need to set up a phone gate. Let, stop letting this little device keep you from the most meaningful moments of your life. Listen, we're not going to put that in a casket with you. It's going to stay here. You need to make memories with your family, friends. You need to do something significant besides scrolling through other people's lives. Listen, you need a gate that sets priorities, that says, I am going to be this kind of person, and I'm going to give time to these kind of people, and I'm going to give my life to do what matters. You, you need this, but without the gates, you'll never have it. So you got you to set that. Okay, here's the last one. The last one's this. Nehemiah knew what God gave him to do was greater. Okay, Nehemiah knew what God gave him to do was greater. Greater than what? Well, greater than whatever the enemy's distraction offered. He, he just knew it was greater. Here's, here's what I really think the key of the issue is. This is what separates Nehemiah and us. We forget that what we're doing is more important than what we're being offered by the enemy. Many of us are distracted because we forget what we're working on, what we're building has a significance to it. Life has a way of taking the meaningful and making it appear mundane. Life has a way of just grinding us down to where we look at all things equally. But all things are not equal. And you have, to, you have to choose to remember what God's given you is greater than what the enemy, the distraction he's offering. Listen, you're not just surviving toddlers. You are raising world changers. And you got to see it that way. Listen, you, you're not just hosting a life group. You're hosting life change that can happen in people's lives. And there's eternal rewards for that. you got to see it that way. Listen, you don't look at it as I'm just going to work and it is 9 to 5. No, 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 no. You are walking into a mission field sent by God to carry his light to a dark place. Listen, when, when you want to go home and, and, and instead of going to the gym, you need to remind yourself, no, 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 what I do at the gym is going to help this thing live 10 years longer so God can continue to use it in a way that's significant. You you got to have a compelling assignment if you're going to refuse an attack of the enemy when it comes to distraction. And for some of you, you've just sold yourself short. You act like what you're doing is not important. And I'm saying remind yourself, if God gave it to you, it is important. That's what Nehemiah did. Chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Now it happened when Sambalot, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab... And the rest of the enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, that Sambalot and Geshem sent to me saying, come let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. Now, I'm just going to throw this in there for free, okay? You should never meet with the devil in a place called Ono, okay? <laughs> because they thought to do me harm. Listen, they invited Nehemiah into a distraction. And you better get this, every day thousands of invitations are going to be sent to your doorstep to be distracted. Thousands on your phone, ding, emails, ding, Facebook, ding, Instagram. Gossip is going to invite you to be a part of that. You're going to be invited into other people's drama. You're going to be invited. You're going to, so they're inviting Nehemiah. But something on the inside of Nehemiah, because he had put God first, because he had some gates, and he remembered, I'm not just stacking bricks. I'm helping restore God's people. There's something compelling about what I'm doing. And you can see it in his language in verse 3. He says, so I sent messengers to them. I sent them a text message back and said, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. 
I'm doing a great work. What I'm doing is significant. It's important. And I can't, I can't give you time because I'm doing a great work. But they sent this message four times, and, and, and he answered them in the same manner. Let, let me say this to you. I want you to notice they kept asking. They kept asking. They kept inviting. They kept saying, come on. They kept trying to distract. But listen, this is why it's so important. You, this tells me that when it comes to overcoming distraction, you're not going to get to a place where you silence the voice of the enemy. So you've got to learn to proceed in spite of his noise. You've you got to just put your head down, and, and you got to. I know he's going to try to distract. I know he's going to offer you. You just got to put your head down and say, no, 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 I'm working on something significant here. See, faith, one of the, I've heard it said that part, the first step of faith is stuffing your ears full of cotton. First step of faith is just sticking where you can't hear it anymore. It reminds me of a story I read about a business owner. His name was DeWitt Wallace. And DeWitt had this dream of, of setting up a, a very special kind of a new, new publication, a magazine. And it was different from this day and age because he wanted to do a small one that was pocket size that he could take. Um, and, and it would be full of inspirational stories. People could read it at work and do all kinds of different things. But, but the critics at the time said, hey, this isn't going to work. They, they just said, people want news. They want information. They don't want inspirational stories. And so he, he, just, he just stuffed his ears full of cotton and just kept on. And he even heard from William Randolph Hearst, who was, who was a famed publicist and a publisher at the time, and, and he said that it wouldn't work. But he just, he just stuffed his ears full and get, get, put the distractions out, and he kept um, pursuing it. He kept collecting thousands of stories. He, he laid it out, and he bought a couple hundred of them. He sold a couple hundred of them. He bought a couple thousand of them. He sold a couple thousand more and more and more. He just continued to, 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 to put away the distractions and pursue what God had put in his heart. And today, Reader's Digest has 23 million readers because Dwight Wallace just decided, I'm not going to listen to the distractions. I'm not going to listen to what, and what I'm saying is this, you need to get some resolve about you. If you're going to do something significant, you need to act like it's significant because people around you aren't going to act like what you're doing matters. You got to act like what you're doing matters. You got to know this is God given. He's given me this to build. He's given me this family. He's given me these kids. He's given me this career and I'm going to make it into something. You need to get some resolve about you. Listen, if you need to borrow Nehemiah's words, then you borrow them, but you need to say, I'm working too great a project to come down and mess with your doubt. I, I, I'm in too great a ministry to worry about gossip. I'm in too great a work to come down and give in to a lack of, of faith and of fear. You need to say, phone, I can't scroll you today. I'm working on a great work in my marriage. Comparison, I, I can't give in to you today because I'm working on building my own dreams. L listen, you need to say, social media, I can't come to you today because I'm working a great work in my kids. L you, you need to say, to yourself the, 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 the distractions. I, I, I'm working a great work. I'm working something that's significant. I'm working something that matters. I don't have time to give myself to you. Listen, if there's anything I would want you to capture today is this. You are called by God to do what you are doing. He put you on this earth at this exact moment in time and history because you can bring him the most glory. He put gifts and callings and passions on the inside of you that nobody else has. And it's too important for for you to fulfill that than to waste your life on things that do not matter. Who cares what Facebook has to say? You got a great work that you got to do. Who cares what other people are saying? You got a great work you got to build up. Who cares what's going on in everybody else's life? You don't need the distraction. You're building something in your home and your family and your life and your ministry. And it's not going to be something that, that, that it just falls away or is temporal. It's important. It's eternal. It was God given. And you got to get to a place where you're willing to fight for it when no one else is where you'll put on the blinders to put out the distractions. You'll stuff your ears from the people who say it can't happen, and you wake up every day and say it's significant. It may not look significant yet, but this is going to be significant one day, and that's the reason I don't have time to come down from this great work and fool with you, enemy. you got to get that on the inside of you because nobody else is going to do that for you. you got to decide to raise your family. Listen, I think the difference between where some of you are and where God's got you, the only distance is passion for what he's called you to do. Listen, passion is not a chemistry. It's not something you just are or you aren't. It's a choice. You can be as passionate about God today as much as you want. You can worship as much as you want today. You can read as much as you want. Listen, there ain't no time limit on that Bible. It's not going to go off. You can have as much of God. You can pour as much into your kids. You, you, you can better yourself as much as you want to. And some of you just need a spiritual infusion of passion 
to remind you that, that what you're doing is significant. It's important. God's doing something in you. And you got to treat it that way.